What really isn't known is how this works on separate sort of more nuanced calcium. That, the reality is, is part of pretty much every single calcified lesion. All calcified lesions have some eccentricity to them, and nodular calcifications are becoming more and more frequent. Okay, so let's start off with nodular calcification. What's unique about nodular calcification is that they account for about 5 to 7% of acute coronary thrombosis. Those are usually eruptive. But more importantly, nodules do really poorly. So if you have a calcified nodules, the event rates in these patients are really high. And the challenges of these calcified nodules are because the therapies that we've had to date can be very misleading. So for an example, we see a calcified nodule which is typically about 10% diameter stenosis lower than the lesions we normally treat. And so what ends up happening is we end up in the situation where we inflate our usual 2.5, 12, or 15 semi-compliant balloon in one view, and it looks perfect. So it looks like it's now expanded, and then what we go ahead is go ahead and place a stent, and once the stent is placed, we end up in this complex situation of an underexpanded stent with a large eccentric piece of calcium pushing it in. We all know that the minimal stent area is the most important long-term predictor of long-term clinical outcomes, but now this has put us into a jam. Now, the dogma to date has been, if you have a nodule, we should perform atherectomy. And the conviction of interventionalists has been, well, I did a, an atherectomy. I, I shaved the nodule off. I cut the nodule off. But let me ask you, if you think about the physics of this, actually the amount of debulking done by a burr is very small. Why? Where do calcified nodules happen? The most proximal part of the vessel. Almost 80% of calcified nodules are in the proximal LED circumflex and right coronary artery. Proximal vessels are large. The most commonly used burrs a 1.5. So what ends up happening is this phenomena, where a very small amount of calcium is actually debulked and then treatment is performed. Here's a great example. This patient is having an atherectomy performed. You can see the minimal luminary is 2.07. And after the atherectomy, the luminary is 2.21. So the amount of debulking is exceedingly small. And the reason that this happens is because we are getting inadequate lesion preparation because of wire bias. What do we know? We know that the calcified nodule patients do much worse. That's been the dogma. If you take patients with calcified nodules and without calcified nodules, their mace is worse. They die more often. They have high clinically driven target lesion revascularization, and they have higher stent thrombosis. So this is truly a unique subset of patients that has very high risk. Now, why IVL? And the reason is the unique mechanism of action of IVL is that it's completely impartial to wire bias. It doesn't matter whether the nodule is at 6 o'clock or 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock. As the balloon inflates and scaffolds the calcium, energy is delivered into the wall. The part of the wall that is fibrous, you lose that energy, but the part of the wall that is calcified, it will start to break the nodule. And here's an example of what can happen to a calcified nodule. Here you see a patient mid-right coronary artery, and I'd like you to focus on the pattern of fracture. So here you have a very tight segment, okay, we perform the IVL, and you get the absolutely classic fracture, which is the box pattern, and you end up with a almost tripling of the minimal lumen area. Here is the very, very dense calcified nodule, which is lots and lots of calcification. The opposite side is soft tissue. In this situation, what ends up happening is we create a fracture, and we know by OCT this depth is underrepresented, and finally what happens, you're basically breaking up this marble into small pebbles, and then you can push them out of the way. And here you can end up when going from 1.5 to 7 millimeters uh, squared of area. In the distal area, you can see we get a conventional calcium fracture, and as a result, can get an excellent luminal result. So this we just published in Jack Intervention, um, and what the take-home message from this data was that actually, unlike all the previous studies to date, if you perform IVL in a calcified nodule or a non-calcified nodule, you actually end up with exactly the same minimal lumen area, minimal stent area, and mean stent area.
Why are these numbers important? These numbers are important because they directly translate to the long-term clinical outcome. If you have the same MSA and MLA in the patients with and without nodules, you can see here the log rank p-value is 0.32, no significant difference in this almost 150 patient population, which is very large for nodules, by the way, at two years. All right, in the last couple of minutes, I'm gonna talk about eccentric calcium. Eccentric calciation, so what? It's in every vessel. Every reviewer that we sent our publication said, well, why do you need to do lesion preparation at all? Well, let's think about this. The classic paradigm is you have a tight lesion, okay? And we go into this modification zone and we perform IBL and we deliver 80 pulses or perform atherectomy where we're going up and down with the burr and we follow that with very high pressure non-compliant balloon. But we then put in a 22 millimeter stent or a 30 millimeter stent or a 38 millimeter stent. And what ends up happening is your minimal stent area ends up in a segment outside of the maximum calcification. <clears throat> and the reason is classically in calcified lesions, we do lesion prep. But what we really need to do is vessel prep. And the, one of the things that you'll notice about the Disrupt CAD series of patients is the lesion length is actually shorter than the calcium length. And what that means is that we're not treating the vessel in entirety, and what's ending up happening is we're ending up with the stent being the smallest minimal stent area outside of the maximum calcified segment, and as a result, this actually ends up driving the clinical outcome. So why can't we just use a balloon for this? Well, the reason is the problem with eccentric calcification is it's like a wishbone. If you put a balloon inside a wishbone and inflate it, one side will crack. But an eccentric calcium, just like a wishbone with one broken half, it's very, very hard to break it because the physics don't allow it. IBL does. Now here's an eccentric calcification, and the mechanism by which this works is the balloon expands towards the calcification, and because there's nothing to fracture, you end up with a deep dissection from the plano balloon angioplasty. But this phenomena also shows, here you have a calcified eccentric lesion you actually go ahead and inflate it. It ends up with what looks like a nice minimal lumen area. You stent it, there's almost immediate recoil, and you can see that the minimal lumen area is only increased by 0.05 millimeters squared after stenting. But the unique mechanism of IVL allows you to modify this very deep calcification. Why? As long as the emitter is next to the calcium, it can break the calcium and allow your stent to be more conformable, more symmetric, and increase your minimal stent area. This is exactly what happens in eccentric calcification. We end up with this type of pattern, and following the pulses, you have a slow and progressive break in the calcium until ultimately when you use a non-compliant balloon, you get excellent expansion. This is an example of where you can see fractures and that the magnitude and number of fractures are directly proportional to the amount of calcium you have. Finally, we showed that the, despite your continuous calcium arc, your minimal stent area ends up the same in eccentric and concentric calcium, and we published this uh, just this week in Circulation Cardiovascular Intervention. Thank you very much.